Hello, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener, the show where you ask the questions and we take a panel of experts and answer those questions. I'm Shane Coulter, I'm your host today. I'm taking place of Sandy Mason, who couldn't be with us, but she left me a great panel to answer those questions. I know you've been out in the garden, it's starting to get nice weather, and this is kind of the time of year where we're rock stars. People stop us where they never normally talk to us, but they ask us those questions that time of year. But today you can call in and get those questions answered. And I'll introduce the panel. Again, I'm Shane Coulter, I'm from Country Arbor's Nursery in Urbana. I'm one of the family owners there, and I, I kind of answer questions about everything there at the nursery. But I'm going to lead it over to the other panel of experts, and they can tell us what they do and what their expertise is, and they probably have a question or two to answer. Chuck? Hey, Shane. I am Chuck Voigt, and I retired from the Department of Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. Specialties were vegetables and herbs, but uh, we can answer questions in other areas if we need to. Um, the question I have is from a person who lives in a town on a main street and they have a bit of grassy area in front of the house where they'd like to do a bit of vegetable planting. Uh, I'd like it to look nice and interesting for passers-by. Uh, can you give me some uh, creative ideas? Well, I would refer you first of all to a book called Edible Landscaping by uh, Roz Creasy. She wrote it in 1982 and was kind of looked on as a kook and then over the years she's become more and more mainstream to where she's now leading the, the tide and I, th I think they've done a, a more recent um, version of it. The first thing before you go ripping up the front yard would be to, to check with your local municipality and make sure there isn't some sort of a law or a covenant that says you can't do that. Uh, hopefully there isn't because, because it, it can be very effective. Uh, we've got some pictures here of some, of some things that, that uh, it, to my mind, are much more attractive than, than lawn that you have to mow weekly or biweekly. Um, you know, attractive plants, some of the vegetables are, are much more attractive, I think, than some of the flowers that we try to grow. Uh, some of the flowering kales are great in the fall. Uh, just, just all kinds of fun things. Raised beds also can, can, can help you. Uh, they, they might help you with actually getting prepared if it's a relatively small area. Uh, the picture you just saw was four eight by eight raised beds, which, which would produce a lot of, of food for people, but also uh, kind of gives you uh, places to walk where you're not walking in the area. And it can go vertical. You can have all kinds of fun with it. Uh, I think it's a great idea, you know, especially if you don't have sun in the backyard or whatever. Yeah, I, mean, I think... <laughs> Honestly, most people would not even notice it if you didn't put it in straight rows. If you work it into the landscape, you know, the reason only most people know about it is because it's in rows, so they know it's a garden. But if you put your strawberries up, it's just like it's fregaria. It's the same plant that you're growing anyway, so why not mix yeah. it in there? They, you could probably yeah. have a garden and not even, you know, yeah. any bother anybody at probably all. Probably want to stay away from, from the, the white stakes at the end of each <laughs> of the rows and make it look like a little graveyard. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fence would a white be pick, really cute. A white picket fence, yes, but the, the little stakes that you put yeah. by each row of things exactly. kind of kind and they of might give know you a that, tomato plant. Give you that, that, they that, figure that out. creepy graveyard feeling. But, but. yeah, edibles are <coughs> definitely uh, you know nothing better than getting stuff right out of your yard. Going to the front yard might be a little different, but it certainly could be done. All right. Well, our next guest is Ella Maxwell. She's going to introduce herself. Hi, I work at Hare Nursery, and I'm a horticulturist there, and I can answer pretty much questions about perennials or trees or shrubs, whatever. And I do have an email question here from Jake. He and his wife enjoy fresh flowers, uh, but neither of them uh, have the time and the money to spend on that. So they'd like some ideas for maybe some annuals or even some perennials that they could plant, that they could cut. And uh, I think that's a great idea. In this spring, you can find a lot of uh, packaged seeds for annuals that uh, you could plant out. And I'd recommend the zinnias that we see in our picture. There's also some snapdragons there. I think uh, cosmos is wonderful. There's some mums as well. And uh, there are several different perennials, the shasta daisies, um, the cone flowers, just uh, a, a array of different plants and you could begin to make the garden bigger and better each year. But I would recommend too that you can use a very minimal single bouquet and add to it with other plant material from your yard, whether it's colorful foliage from shrubs or evergreens or maybe even some leaves from your house plant. So you can enjoy some type of fresh greens or fresh arrangements year round. 
Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, people. It's surprising how many things are in your yard at all points in time, and when you start hunting for it. So nothing better than a nice bouquet on the table. Well, thank you very much. And last but not least, Phil, you can introduce yourself. I'm Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. Uh, an entomologist is somebody who studies insects, so I'll take your bug questions as best I can. Uh, we have a an email sent in from Victoria. And she says that one of her Amber Jubilee nine barks has exhibited major branch <coughs> die off to the point it needs to be dug out. When I cut back the dead wood and look at the cut ends, I can see what appear to be white larvae under the bark. What might they be and how can I control or eliminate them to save my other bushes? Well, nine bark really doesn't have a bore of its own. Uh, it has a tendency to have various, various types of uh, of bores that'll get in when the plant's under stress, such as the uh, flat-headed apple tree <coughs> bore shot that you're seeing on the, on the screen at this point. Uh, and uh, you'll also get various types of bark beetles and, and ambrosia beetles that, uh, that, that you can see on the screen now that will, uh, they're very small beetles. The adults are typically an eighth of an inch long or so, larvae just a little bit larger and they'll they'll make some tunneling underneath a bark or make little pockets underneath a bark to feed in. And so these, uh, these are coming in and they're essentially secondary that the plant's under stress and not doing very well, uh, doing some dieback, if you will, and they're there secondarily. And so the real answer for controlling this problem is to keep the plants from declining. And many shrubs, including uh, nine bark, is, is gonna be of benefit if it is renewal pruned every so many years. That essentially is a fancy way of saying you cut the plant off the ground and let it grow back out. Uh, you might want to do just a few branches each year so that you don't have something that's completely bare or you can do it all at once. The root system can handle either. Uh, and uh, particularly with a, with a plant such as variety such as Amber Jubilee, which tends to have a little more in the way of yellow or foliage. As a general rule, those plants that don't have the dark green foliage are, are, are going to be a little less thrifty and are going to be more susceptible to die back and, and so on. So all you do is renew your, your, your shrubs every so often. Make sure you realize that nine bark is best as a shrub. Don't try to grow it into a tree. If you want a small tree, buy a small tree. Uh, if you've got nine bark, consider it as a shrub and it'll do a nice six foot tall shrub for you and just renew it, prune it every few years and you won't have the bore problem. Yeah, it's nice to be able to knock something back to the ground and have it come come back. It's, it's kind of a satisfying thing. It actually. does. I don't know if it's just me, but I, <laughs> and you, you kind of want to wait. Probably yeah. the best type thing to do would be wait until the spring, when you start seeing leaves coming out on on the on yeah. the branches and so on. And those that just don't seem to have very many leaves, cut those off. And those are the ones that are really declining. And they can put two or three foot right back on, so it's not like it's going to just die back to nothing and you've lost the whole year. You'll be just fine. So. That's great, but before we get to any questions, I want to remind you that we here at Mid-American Gardener do a podcast, and you can be part of that podcast by calling 217-300-8224, and that's a, a voicemail that you can leave a question that may be answered here, may be answered on the podcast, and it can 24 hours a day. You can call it any time, so if you can't sleep at night, pick up the phone, leave a, uh, leave a voicemail, and we'll answer it maybe later, and our, our podcast this week was none other than our guest here, Ella, today. Did you have fun on the podcast? I did. Victoria and I uh, answered a lot of questions, and, and it was very it was exciting. I hope people will listen and uh, learn. Did she have any goofy questions? I know a lot of times I've heard people that she has some crazy off-the-wall question. Did she get you no, on nothing like no, that? No, we didn't. Oh, yes. If you were <laughs> yeah. a vegetable, uh, what would you be? Yeah, see, so that's what you have to look forward to. You can you listen go. to the podcast, and there's a couple ways you can get the podcast. You can go to iTunes, you can go to Stitcher, you can go to NPR One, or you can download it at midamericangardener.org, where you can also see some past videos. So if you want to be part of that, go ahead and download the podcast and leave a little voicemail. Now, if you're going to call today, you also have to call a special number, which I don't have on the screen, but you can call in and that's what we're going to do tonight. So we're going to go ahead and start with our first call, Steve from Bloomington. You had a question on bulbs, Steve? All right. Well, <clears throat> 
the best time for the bulbs is after it has yellowed and 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 completed the its 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 cycle because those green leaves are feeding the bulbs right up to the point where they yellow and and fall over unfortunately they can get a little unsightly before they get to that point but um, maybe you can interplant it with something else that kind of masks that a little bit because you really really want to have that recharge uh, for the bulbs so that they they make uh, good flowering the the following year because if, if you if you cut back the foliage too soon you, you, they'll decline and uh, won't be as good as they could be yeah a lot of people I, <coughs> one of my neighbors she actually braids it to make I mean she has a little more time than I do <coughs> but she actually braids the top and it's it looks pretty nice and you can barely see it it kind of <coughs> probably is cutting down the photosynthesis a little bit yeah. but, but if if it's that or cut it off then definitely braid yeah, it. yeah definitely but yeah you need to do that and I know it's unsightly but you're right Plan around it, you'll be just fine. All right, we're gonna go to line three with Kimberly of Jacksonville. She has a hydrangea question. Yes, I planted hydrangeas and they get very, very little. Did I move? So I heard, I heard that she has hydrangeas and it gets very little sun. She's saying, does she need to move it is what I think she said. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, as far as hydrangeas go, you really need to know what kind they are and whether or not they're tolerant they're of endless. endless summers. Yes. Okay, and well, endless summer is a reblooming or remontant hydrangea, so it will make a uh, second season of blooms in September, but sometimes those first blooms that should be coming in June, uh, they die back. So you just get the foliage and you're disappointed. But uh, I don't know necessarily that moving it is going to solve the problem. I would recommend that you mulch them well and have them sided in a spot that does get a little bit more protection and maybe try uh, a, a fall fertilization or even a spring one with a high phosphorus or potassium, not so much nitrogen. What do you guys think? Another thing that you can do is just let the plant tell you whether it needs to have a sunnier location. If it's looking well, it's got plenty of foliage and it is blooming, then it's fine. If, it's, uh, if you're getting very straggly looking foliage on the plant, doesn't seem to be growing very well, then moving it to a more sunnier location might be a good option. So, you know, the, the plant will tell you, and it's just like Ella said, different varieties and, and, and different species of hydrangea have different needs and some will grow in fairly uh, deep shade and others like it sunnier and the plant will let you know which it which it likes right and those endless summer types I've heard them referred to as endless bummers yeah. because they don't quite <laughs> do what you think they're going to do when you have a winter like we had this year I've been told they're called endless death but <laughs> oh, well there you go oh, they, yeah. can, they can be good at times yeah they can be quite good yeah. they're, 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 quite, they're, they're quite an improvement on what we had before but right. sometimes yeah. our expectations Correct. get so high that we forget that they're growing things and they don't always do well yeah. and, and they are making more varieties and a good one to buy is bloomstruck I've been impressed with its uh, performance. Yeah, I mean, I see so many pictures out in Oregon where <coughs> it's a perfect blue color and they're blooming all the time. You have to remember we're in Illinois. You step out in February and you're reminded how cold yeah. it can get around here. But yeah, the, they do the, perform. There's some beautiful ones in the Rose Garden in, in, in Portland. but <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we aren't and, in Portland. And, uh, something that I was thinking the <coughs> other day, that's a pretty good, if it's a pointy flower, it takes more sun. If it's rounded, it's almost always more shade. So that's one that's thing with the paniculatas. That's, that's the only way I could break it down in 30 seconds. So, all right, we're going to go to <coughs> another question. We've got Carol on line four from Catlin. She's got a sowing grass seed question. Yes, when can I sow grass seed and what is the prep procedure? Well, the ideal time is, is mid-August to, to mid-September, but I, I, I'm assuming you're thinking about doing it this spring, which is okay, but you need to get it done as soon as the soil can be, can be safely worked. You know, if it's too muddy, you don't want to mess with it, but as soon as it starts to dry out, uh, get out there. Uh, depending on if you're replacing what was sod before or if you're starting with new stuff you want to have it worked up you want to have impediments rocks and stuff moved as much as you can um, a fairly fine seed bed 
You want to spread the grass seed as evenly as you can, uh, rake it in, and then, and then tamp it down so that it's in good contact with the soil. And then uh, while it's sprouting, you want to water it fairly frequently. It doesn't need to be too deeply. But once, it, once it's growing, then you want to water less often but more thoroughly so the roots go down further into the soil. And uh, the reason it's better in the fall is because it's getting cooler and there's, there's less stress on it. There's less weed competition in the spring. Everything's off and growing and it's going to get hot and start to be stressed. But uh, since, since you're asking now, I think probably as soon as you can, you, as soon as conditions allow would be, would be best and, and don't straggle on till the end of, of April because that gets into. Yeah, the hotter it gets, the harder it gets to water right. it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so tax day, get it done by tax day. Yeah, yeah we finish by tax day and start at Labor Day. Labor Day is a, a, a perfect time to get out yeah. there uh, when it comes to sowing. Those are the two primary fertilizing dates as well. Yeah, exactly. So, that, so <coughs> yeah, it can be done, but water gets a little difficult in, in summer, but, it, but, you know, I've seen people sow in the middle, dead heat of summer. You just got to get the hose out there and camp out and literally sit by the spigot. So, all right. So we're going to go to another phone call. We've got a question from Angie uh, from Gibson City who's got a question about fruit trees. Angie, you have a question for us? Uh, yes, uh, I have a problem with the length of my tree was flat, but never produced any fruit. If I can put fruit this time of year, that uh, get fruit this year. Well, I didn't quite <laughs> yeah, we didn't qu quite get your question on what kind of tree it was, but the most important thing to understand is for apples and the sweet cherries and pears, most of them require a pollinator from another uh, variety so that you get that cross-pollination. And of course, they have to have fruit buds to flower. And if you're not seeing flowers, uh, and they have to flower at the same time so that the bees can do that work. So I hope that we can help answer those questions. I'm sure you've, Chuck's got some other ideas. Well, uh, fruit trees don't, uh, uh, don't do especially well in the shade like a lot of other things. So uh, more sunlight w will help them store the energy that they need to form the fruit buds that then bloom and, and, and do you, you covered the, the pollination issues pretty well. Also, if it happens to be cold and rainy when, they, when they're flowering, they won't stay in flower very long and the bees won't be as active as they might be. Um, also, you don't want to, you want to be careful with what you're spraying on them because you don't want to <laughs> discourage the bees with what you're, with what you're yeah. discourage means kill the bees uh, while they're doing it. But, um, uh, particularly apples are going to do better on on uh, on more horizontal branches things that are more like 45 degree angles and so if you're pruning off the of spreading branches and leaving the ones going upright uh, with apples or pears and even to a certain extent with peaches and you're going to end up cutting off uh, the flower buds in your pruning operations another thing is is that many plant trees fruit trees will will produce fruit a little bit better if they're if they're not heavily fertilized, too much fertilizer, you end again of, of too much nitrogen fertilizer particularly, you're gonna end up getting more leaves than you are fruit. And so these are all things, sometimes you can love them too much and they don't, uh, they don't pay you back. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. I think fruit trees can be a little bit of work, but the result is you get fruit. So yeah. <laughs> that's the, yeah. Exactly, fruit's not free. All right, we're gonna go to line three. We have a question from Joe in Bloomington about pruning arborvitae. Uh, yes. Um, what is the best way and when is the best time to trim back arborvita trees, both in height and width? Thank you. Well, I, I think with the arborvitae, they do have a little branchlets that they're going to shed on the interior part, but they have lots of uh, initiation points for new growth, so they do take shearing uh, with an electric shears or hand hand shears and you could take a lopper and take some of the height out uh, the problem is they kind of can open up yeah I, I would and, and you could do it this spring don't you think yeah I would normally do it like before the growth spurt in the spring or, or right after the growth spurt in the spring and then maybe again 
as you get fairly late in the fall, you don't want to force them into to excess growth as you're going toward winter, but uh, there are a number of times when you can do it. They're, they're pretty tolerant of... Yeah, I mean, we'll actually take arborvitaes and shear them like a hedge. And so we planted some uh, that were, we planted them almost ball to ball to ball and then topped them and then and brought them in the side. And it's a wall, but it's never been more than five feet for 15 years. Uh, just because we, we didn't, ha at the time, didn't have Hicksai and Taxis, and we, didn't, we wanted to try something different. Mm -hmm. and, it, and they responded well to shearing. It's 20 year, 15 years old now, and it's starting to get a little thin, but that's also a selection. When you take the, something that's really tight, shear it, and then it gets a hole in it, it's kind of hard to come back from. But uh, yeah, they respond well. We're in the fields now, trimming up a little bit for the spring. So, all right, well, we're going to go to line five. We're going to, Keith's been waiting a little while. Keith from Paxton, do you have a question about strawberries? Yeah, I do. I, I always seem to have a lot of blooms, but then I don't necessarily get very many strawberries. What am I doing wrong? Um, how, how do you treat them <clears throat> at the end of winter? Generally, I don't do a whole lot to them outside of I usually fertilize them in the fall and again in the spring. Do you put any sort of a mulch on them over the winter? No, but they, again, the uh, the plants are, all look very healthy, and they're covered in blooms. Okay, the the thing I'm trying to get to is is if they start growing too soon in the spring, then the blossoms come out earlier, and they're and they're much more subject to uh, frost damage. Um, so I don't know, but that's fairly obvious if they get frosted because the the center of the blossom turns sort of blackish instead of the nice yellow that, that they would normally be. Um, one frosty night, uh, as Doc Skirvin has told us many times, can actually eliminate 95% of the fruit. So uh, that's why I was kind of feeling it out because if, if you can mulch them with straw or something and leave that on you know, through these false spring days that we've, that we've had quite a few of this, this, this late winter, uh, and, and try to hold them back as much as you can. And then when they, they just won't be held back, then take that off and let them go. And hopefully you've delayed the bloom enough so that frost won't be an issue. Yeah, yeah, it really wasn't, it wasn't about pro, you know, you know, pro, protecting them over the winter. It was about protecting them in the early spring, late winter. It, it also helps with that because yeah. sometimes they can freeze, but his plants are healthy, so that, that's yeah. not the issue. Yeah, he's had a good place for them. Well, hopefully that helps a little bit and you can finally get some strawberries. So we're going to go to line four. Krista from Bloomington had a question about sycamore moths. Yes, we, we have uh, uh, sycamore trees that have the tussock moth. And then I'd say July into August, there are these like caterpillars or whatever dropping out of the trees. And I mean, there are hundreds of them. And is there anything we can do for the um, to to help the tree, the sycamore? Is it going to kill the tree, or is it just anything we can do to get rid of it? Boy, you've got an entomologist heaven. <laughs> I've looked and looked and looked and looked for any trees of sycamore that have more than two or three uh, sycamore tussock moth larvae on them. I would. That, that's just that would just be nirvana for me. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you know that's maybe you uh, can get her address That would just off be fabulous. Air. You know, it's uh, uh, normally I've I have I've been looking at sycamores for forty years. I haven't ever seen a tree with more than two on it. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the larvae will get up to about an inch and a half long. They're real fuzzy. Have black long uh, uh, pencils or or pieces of hair that stick out. Two on the front, two on the back. Uh, they're kind of cute as a button, but at any rate, you can control them if they get too heavy uh, with a spray of Bacillus thuringiensis kirstaki. You go in and ask at a, at a nursery or garden center for BTK, and they'll fix you up. It's sprayed on the tree. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, is you probably won't be able to get to the top of the tree. Uh, the sycamore tussock moth normally comes in in mid to late summer, which means uh, losing leaves at that time of year is not a real factor too much on, on any tree. And so you can ignore it and it'll be fine. But, uh, but, if you, uh, but it can be, can be something that uh, you can get a lot of uh, fecal matter on the patio underneath or something. 
that you need to sweep off, but, uh, and you can knock them back, but it's, I wouldn't necessarily spend a lot of money to have a tree sprayed because they'll do fine, even though they get defoliated in late, mid to late summer like that, they'll, they'll be fine. Yeah, and the BT is also what you spray on bagworms, if I remember yes, correctly. Yes, absolutely. Or, or around the first July. And cabbage For worms. cabbage worms. Yeah. Cabbage <coughs> worms. Pretty much yeah. any worms when it comes Ca to spraying. Caterpillars. 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 Yeah. Caterpillars right. See, that's why we have you guys on here. That's you know why they exactly. pay entomologists. And, and that's, uh, you know, that was in your wheelhouse. When, <laughs> you know, when they, uh, when they, it's like setting the tea up for you yeah. when it comes yeah, to bugs. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like throwing the ball to me underhand and, yeah. and uh, you know, next week uh, the... Uh, Baseball season starts, so we're all ready for it. It didn't, it didn't sound like your wife got on the phone. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for watching and spending time with us. Uh, remember to call in, leave a voicemail if you have more questions, and we will see you next week. Thank you.